Well, hello and welcome everybody to another episode of Connect Conversations. Today's conversation is all about repair or replace, and it's brought to you part of Mobius Connect's ongoing YouTube series, Connect Conversations. I'm Kim Fugger, the manager of Mobius Connect, and I will be your moderator for today. First, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the hosts of Connect Conversations, global reliability improvement experts, Ron Moore, Gary Tyne, and Andrew Frazier. How are you guys? We're good. Good. Everybody made it on time. (laughs) Well, before I officially pass the mic right over to you guys, I just want to encourage our audience here today. If you do have any questions or comments, please go ahead and enter them in the chat area of the platform here. And while Ron, Gary, and Andrew are speaking, they will take time to answer your questions on the air anonymously. And if you do have any direct questions while they're going and do not wanna do it publicly, you can go ahead and chat it directly to me or any of the hosts, they are watching those too. All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to you. Okay, thank you, Kim. And thanks again to Andrew and Gary for joining us. Um, The uh, topic today is should we repair or replace? Well. You know, the short answer is it depends. And so we're going to talk about some of those factors that it depends upon. Uh, This question came up when a a colleague called me and said, is there a simple way to determine whether or not you do this? You know, like a simple algorithm or formula. And if there is one, I don't know about it. So what we're going to do is just go through a series of questions to consider as to whether or not you should do this. And and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rattle off these questions uh, and then we'll come back and try to answer or comment on each one. And uh, Andrew and Gary or whoever out there, if you have other questions that we need to be asking, feel free to, to throw those in because this was just a, off the top of my head, what are the, some of the things to consider? So the, Before you even get to the question of repair or replace, the first question I would be asking is, would our equipment benefit from some sort of defect elimination uh, process? You know, I don't see much point in replacing, or in some cases, maybe even repairing equipment. Of course, you have to do that. But if all you're going to do is run it into the ground again quickly thereafter, so that that ought to be at the forefront of questions you're asking if you're thinking about or you've had serious problems with equipment in the past. Are your practices inducing those, or is it really the equipment? Hmm. So that's one question. Next, next one would be, well, what's the current state of the asset? You know, is it really just you can't restore it to like new performance? Well, if you can't do that, maybe it's a simple you know, a simple decision, you, you may have to replace it. But if it's not, and you've been having problems, maybe because of your practices or whatever, then you got to take that to the next level of analysis. Uh, then the third question is, what's expected of the asset over the coming one, five, 10 years? You know, if, for example, if you're shutting down in a year, well, you're going to limp along. If you're just want to hold performance for the next five, then that may give you a little different answer. Or alternatively, if you're expecting to increase capacity and rate and all that sort of thing, well, that may give you another answer entirely. Anyways, next one is, uh, well, it's a money question. What's in your budget for capital? Because if you don't have the capital, well, Maybe the decisions made for you, you know, and what's in your budget for maintenance. So those are, you know, two kind of uh, gateways into the decisions you might make. Uh, Next question, is there new technology that makes the process of the equipment much more effective, efficient in terms of rate or quality or, you know, cost of operation? So that might you know, impact the decision you make. And then finally, what's the availability of spare parts for the foreseeable future? So that would probably have an impact on your decision as well. Uh, Let me pause there before we go back to that first question and 
see if you guys have any others to add to this. Wow. Yeah, that, there was a lot of questions there, uh, Ron, uh, to address. Um, I'm just looking at, I just quickly jotted some of those down as you were, as you were speaking. Um, yeah. The um, one thing as well, the repair versus replace is probably um, warranty periods as well, considering the warranties of the of the spares or the components that have failed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think I do. I do see a lot of um, companies actually replacing parts <laughs> that they could have claimed under warranty and have actually paid for them again. So war warranty okay. claims is something I would probably have a question against. Okay. And, and the warranty of the new equipment, if you're thinking about buying the new equipment, okay? So that would, you know, that's, that's a good point, Gary. Any yep. others or Andrew, do you have any? I have nothing to add on that, no, no. Okay. All right. Well, let's go back to that first question. You know, would the, would the equipment benefit from some sort of, uh, you know, uh, defect elimination or improvement in your operating and maintenance practices? And... In just about every operation that I've been in, the answer to that is yes. And in some cases, it's it's a must. You know, why would I give you more money to buy more equipment when you operate it like it's a used car and you maintain it like it's a like it's a, a rental car? You know, why would I do that? So I'll let you guys comment on that. Andrew, do you want yeah. to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's for me. It's linked also to the the state of the assets as well. I think that those two things, in terms of the practices and the condition of the assets, that I've seen them go together a lot. Um, you can infer actually from the state of the assets what some of the state of the practices might be uh, that are a little bit un more unseen. Um, <clears throat> and I think the uh, alongside all that, I think is that one of the myths about this that is that um because if my assets got poor performance that's related to it being old whereas um there's very real, very little correlation between components failure rate and age of equipment so it flies against that idea but i think there is a common mindset that because this asset is maybe 20, 30 years old compared to one that's five years old, that the reason for its um, poorer performance is just simply down to the fact that it's older, where it's more likely to be, uh, in my experience, it's been a sort of a lack of love and care that the asset hasn't seen. Um, perhaps it's more, in some cases, sort of neglect of the asset. And alongside that, <clears throat> the, the neglect of the systems that um, are used to uh, run the asset, like the quality of data going into the maintenance management system or the the rigor around the way in which OEE is measured and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I, I see all those things sort of coming, I guess, coming together. They're very, very interrelated, all these, all those aspects. Just a side comment. I was in an operation once. It was a, a stamping plant. They actually stamped out uh, blank coins for mints around the world and and they had just to put a new production line in and i looked at the site manager and i said tell me something what's that line going to look like in five years you know, is it going to look like those old lines because if it is you just blew you know whatever 10 million 20 million dollars if it's hmm. not then okay you probably you know, in pretty good shape. And Gary, do you have any any comments on that? You know, yeah. Um, I mean, the um, from a defect elimination, I, I'm a huge advocate for being able to, um, you know, look at look at the defects and and understand the cause of them. You know, maybe like formal root cause analysis, but also um, with component failures, um, understanding. And, and maybe mm -hmm. doing some reliability analysis. So understanding the mean time between failure of, of, of those component failures and, and trying to determine how are the how are the components failing. So within the defect elimination process, it's 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 not just important to know when something's failed, but how it's failed. And and once we understand how it's failed, 
then we can go and determine what the strategy is either. Do do we understand the do hmm. we repair, do we replace? But before we make that decision, I need to know how it's failed and and, yeah. and maybe plot the plot the data using using some you know Weibull analysis or um um you know some sort of um more detailed I analysis used, of the failure. I used RCM or FMEA you know, type yeah. of review. Yeah. And yeah. now what about the, the next one? What's what's the asset condition? And can it be restored mm -hmm. to like new condition? You know, I, I mean I've and Andrew and I've and you have too, Gary, been in plants where you look at the asset and you go, Oh, there's just no hope. You know. <laughs> and maybe there was hope, it just was dirty and you know, leaking and just look bloody awful. So, uh, but there ought to be, you know, one thing that I would suggest is you, know, you know, just clean the asset, hmm. clean it, right? And hmm. see what you find. Because I know Andrew and I have, have both been in, around plants where we, we, <clears throat> we, I say the collective we, the other site guys cleaned the asset, found all kinds of defects. And really, it could have been restored quite nicely when my first impression was, oh, geez, there's no hope. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, so, you know, some sort of comprehensive review of the asset's condition and whether or not it's realistic to restore it to some sort of like new level of performance. Uh, mm. you, know, you, you guys add, add to that, if you will. Yeah, I think that, I think the mindset is uh, it's not... Uh, an older plant that's not been well cared for is never going to look like a brand new plant, but it should look like uh, an asset that's cared for. You know, if the asset is critical to the business, it should look critical to the business as a well, mindset. I, there, there's a key word I used in there, restore it to like new performance. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, because older assets, you may never get them to look like they're brand new out of the box. Right. Mm -hmm. But they should look reasonably cared for. And, you know, they, their performance should be you know, somewhere. You mm -hmm. should be able to restore it to something approaching like new. You know, and I, as we're talking, I'm thinking about my old Jeep. <clears throat> you know, it's it's old like me. You know, it's just what have to do the math here. 36 years old now. And. I'm actually having trouble getting parts and getting service because people don't want to work on old cars. <laughs> so, anyways, back to the Gary. I think do you have anything I, do, oh, yeah. sorry. I don't know. Just gonna add, and then I'll ask Gary to come in. Um, I mean, one particular example, and it's a plant that you know well, Ron. Uh, the state of the asset was uh, very poor. Lots of opportunity for improvement uh, to turn a positive spin on it. Um, but also alongside that, there was a lot of equipment, redundant equipment that had just been allowed to stay in stay in position. And um, and it wasn't clear, actually, what was live equipment and what was redundant equipment. So as part of the process of improving the condition of the asset to like a good news car, they, uh, the company decided to, to systematically go through a process of removing all the redundant equipment. And as they did so, they found a process pipe that was been held up by a rope, All right? So, and that was a huge defect, a huge process safety issue just that was unclear. So in terms of, it's not just, it's not just from a financial point of view or a, an, an aesthetic sort of point of view, when you actually do go through a, a systematic defect elimination program, you can always find some, you, you avoid future problems by some of the things you find. Gary, you yeah, no, I agree with that. I agree with that comment as well, Andrew. Um, the other, the other um, <clears throat> side of it is, I, I mean, I know I touched on on you know doing some level of analysis and and maybe an <clears throat> RCM or a Famica type approach. <clears throat> um, but on on the flip side, I've also seen organisations expect the outcome of an RCM study to to actually, once we once we change the maintenance program, that the asset will suddenly become more reliable, and we'll, we will eliminate some of the defects. But it's it is about that condition assessment. Um, I was having the, a very similar conversation today 
Um, and it is about making sure that the asset is actually fit for purpose and ready for the new maintenance program. Um, I, I, I did I did a condition assessment on a bucket a bucket elevator a number of years ago, and we'd done the reliability study. Uh, but prior to the study, we actually went and physically did a condition assessment, and 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 a new maintenance program would not have changed um, the de the rate of defects that they were experiencing because it, things were just not fit for purpose and were were beyond the end of life. Mm -hmm. Well, that needs so, to be thrown in there as well. Let's yeah. see if there's nothing else on those two. <laughs> uh, What's expected of the asset in the coming one, five, ten years? <laughs> and we touched on that, you know, and I said earlier, you know, if you're closing the plant in a year, well, you're just going to, you know, limp along, patch and so on until you get to the end of life. But if you're if you're growing <laughs> and you expect to be able to sustain a, you know, three, four, five percent growth rate or even more then that puts it in a different category and and you know the next 10 years for that matter so if the market's good and you have you know reasonable pricing and all that sort of thing then that would might influence your decision first of all about whether or not you need to sustain or or replace the asset and secondly about whether <clears> or not you're going to have the capital you know the cash flow to uh, support that so yeah, let me bounce it off to you guys any comments on that one I mean, for myself, Ron, that um, un understanding the life cycle of the asset, you know, and um, if if in year five um, you, you're going to increase the, the you want an increase in production capacity, or you want an increase in year two, you know, <coughs> maybe, maybe some of the the maintenance strat strategies may have to change. Um, you might have to incorporate more redundancy. Um, into the design to meet meet capacity outputs, but I, I'm a I'm a strong believer in that life cycle modelling, um, you know, life cycle analysis of, of an asset, um, so you can actually put plans in place from day one or even part way through the life. It doesn't really matter. But having a having a life cycle model um, is is an important element, I think, for organisations um, looking after their assets. Or at least a life cycle way of thinking. You know, I've yeah. having you know tried to create examples of life cycle analysis. It's uh, it's not easy because you're prognosticating, you're trying to anticipate and forecast. And as we know, the minute you do the forecast, hmm. you know, five minutes later, it's it's wrong. <laughs> but at least it gives you a basis for making decisions. So that's yeah. that's the value in that. Andrew, do you have any comments on this? Uh, you know, what's expected of the asset over the you know, for the next few years? Okay. Nothing in addition to what's been said, no. All right. So next question is a pretty simple one. You know, <laughs> uh, what's it, what do you have in your budget for capital, for maintenance? You know? <clears throat> so, you know, if the capital budget is thin – then that may make the decision easier. Or if the capital budget is robust, maybe you've been bought out by a venture capitalist and they're going to throw you all kinds of money your way. Uh -huh. <laughs> Usually it's just the opposite. But anyways, let's, let's suppose for a minute that that's the case. Then, and what they're trying to do is, you know, reduce maintenance costs. So, you know, it, it, it's one of those situations where you're, in some cases, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause there and stop yammering on and let you guys, you know, throw in whatever you might. Yeah. Or not. I, I, <laughs> yeah. Andrew, go ahead. I'm not sure if you're going to go on to this or not, but I might, as you're talking about money and I guess the business case for, uh, for for a new asset, um, uh, and well, I mentioned about the myth of the reason why uh, an, an old asset is uh, the poor poor performance because the asset's uh, old. I think another um, myth is uh, just if you decide to go and replace it with a a new with with spending capital, that that is going to solve your reliability issues. So per se. 
Um, because often it's in the first couple of years, particularly in more complex assets, larger assets, where there are a lot of reliability issues that have got to be addressed that come in with with the new asset, which, <clears throat> in my experience at least, were never forecast to have, to have happened when the business case calculations were being turned around in the first place. So there was an, it's an always, uh, in my we mind, an, an over- interloper in our background. We have. <laughs> But but a lovely a lovely interloper. <laughs> you can see you, honey. <laughs> I feel like the guy on national TV where the little girl kind of scooted in and yeah, yeah. he came and got her. <laughs> so I think the the, the 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 comment I'm trying to make here is that the the business case calculations in in replacing uh, a new asset, particularly if it's a sort of a larger asset. Uh, and involving a lot of equipment, they tend to be over optimistic in what the business return is going to be. And you end up actually not only suffering sales turnover issues, higher maintenance costs, but often you've got to then have some restoration costs and maybe sort of further capital that needs to be spent to put right things that are in the new asset. And those, it's um, it's not common in my experience for that realism to that realism to be to be built into the, the business case when considering replacing uh, existing assets. Gary, any... yeah, no, that's all good, Ron. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, uh, next question is kind of a to me kind of an obvious one: Is there new technology that makes the process of the equipment much more efficient, either in you know production capability, yield, cost, quality? And so, and that that kind of there's the opposite of that question. That is, can you get parts? I guess that's probably that's the next one that we're going to address. I'm, you know, just again, I'm relating to my old Jeep. You know, not only can I not have difficulty getting parts, but nobody wants to work on it. You know, it's too old. <clears throat> <laughs> so I've cut a deal, you know, with my. Uh, my repair guy, Auto Works, that I'm, I'll find the parts or I'll do my best, and you put them in, but there's no warranty, right? He's, he said, look, you're buying the parts. I'm not warranting anything that I do other than the, the quality of my work. So, you know, you're going to run into hmm. that. Anyways, hmm. back, back to the question, you know, uh, is there, you know, new equipment that's going to advance you know, your process capability, your quality, and so on. So he, he comments there. And I, by the way, I have created a couple of examples. Of, as you, I think I sent you guys a copy of a paper I wrote where I tried to address some of these issues. So mm-hmm. any comments there, guys? Just for me on, on new technology, I think one of the things with that repair versus replace, um, almost that calculation that we need to take, Take, that needs to take place. Um, new technology is often more energy efficient, and yeah. and and I think energy efficiency mm-hmm. is becoming more dominant in the in in industry, and and that is something that we should probably take into consideration as well at the um, at the decision making process. Uh, you know, do we continue running the old assets? And putting a repair program in place, hmm. um, an overhaul program, when actually we might be able to replace it with something new, which is far more energy efficient. That also is part of your your calculation. Yeah, and also uh, it's a really good point, uh, Gary, as well. And, and also part of the maybe the sustainability goals for the company. So yeah. it's not just a financial consideration. It's uh, there's a broader value for the company as well. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I'm I'm just thinking offhand about uh, a, a plant that Andrew and I spent some time at, and and they the paint pigment plant. Let's just uh, you know generically talk about it that way. Mm-hmm. And you know, one end of the plant would benefit tremendously from new technology because the the old technology was inefficient, <laughs> was high energy, was high maintenance. You know, it just, it was, I mean, it was just awful. <laughs> so <clears throat> there there was a, a 
an obvious case there to replace the old technology with new technology. But there was also a caveat that went with that, and that is we're not going to spend the money on this new technology if you guys are going to continue <laughs> to operate and maintain the old technology with the just awful practices you currently have in place. So you're going to have to demonstrate to me that you're capable of implementing hmm. better operating and better maintenance practices before we're going to sink the money into this. So anyway, hmm. com any comments there? Only that they did. They did. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they did. <laughs> both <laughs> of, both counts, of, right? Both of them did, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So the, the, the guys in the plant, you know, improved their game and the people authorize the capital, and that, I reckon that plant continues to operate in a, a reasonably uh, sound manner. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gary, do you have anything on that one? No, none for me, Ron. Thank you. Okay. And then the last issue, and then I want to hmm. come back to the <laughs> warranty issue here in a minute uh, and just make a comment about that. Uh, the availability and cost of spare parts. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's getting to be a real problem <laughs> for one of my assets which makes me you know fret about having to go out and spend you know tens of thousands of dollars on a new one as as my scottish blood <clears throat> kicks in you know as andrew would know about scottish blood wouldn't you andrew i just a bit <laughs> so no, my, anyways, my, wife, come, my, my wife knows about it as well yeah well mine does too so <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, comments on the availability and cost of spares, if any, you know. Well, obsolescence, you know, with, when we talk about availability of spares, you know, having um, a really good, well-documented obsolescence report on, on, on any facility, it, it's almost like, um, you know, it, it, it's just awesome to have in place um, a, a really good understanding of what you've got installed, hmm. what is your installed base out on the plant, and what levels of obsolescence have you currently got, and and having an obsolescence replacement program, um, because you know we, we we come across it too many times where assets have failed and we've we've done root cause analysis and and downtime has been increased downtime has been attributed to the fact that this spare wasn't even identified as obsolete um so yeah it's uh, it is it, it is getting more and more um commonplace in in some of the studies that we're involved in is that obsolescence and availability of spares mm -hmm. so, now one comment on the warranty and then i want to talk a little bit about an example that's uh, in this paper um one one of the things that uh, Folks, uh, I've come across folks who have said, well, we need to do this maintenance because if we don't do it, it'll void our warranty. And that's a legitimate comment. I completely agree with that. But I would, for folks out there listening, I would take that a step further and ask myself or ask the, you know, the question, well, when I do this maintenance, how much production do I lose? What is it costing me to do the maintenance? And is that worth the value of the warranty? Because I've literally seen examples where the warranty isn't worth, you know, uh, spending the money because the maintenance was on a time basis. And as, as we know, you know, the failures tend to be on a condition basis. And so, you know, putting a reasonably good uh, condition monitoring program and understanding failure modes related to do to that, <clears throat> put an effective program in place, is probably going to be better than worrying about any warranty coverage. So, and the second thing I've observed, if if you do file a warranty claim, you're going to get in a legal fight. Of, of you know, if it's of any you know significant consequence, they're going to challenge your practices, and you'll probably lose. <laughs> no. So I would be just a little bit circumspect about overdoing 
maintenance <clears throat> in the interest of retaining a warranty. So do you, you guys see any comments on that one? Yeah. Just that. I, yeah. Go on, Andrew. No, no, you go. You, you go. Yeah, no, I, I mean, um, the, um, of, a, of a great example, <laughs> Uh, I won't name the the company, other to say, other to say that they were they are a global drinks manufacturer, um, and they had one of their filling machines that had to be maintained under warranty on an annual basis, and when that warranty maintenance was being performed, they were actually replacing all of the main components, all of them were being replaced. And and as a consequence of that, the actual startup of the machine after the maintenance had been performed, with the, it could not get back to pre-shutdown um, operational availability because they were suffering from infant mortality type failures on these new components that hadn't really required replacement. And when we started to look at some of those components that were being replaced on warranty, there wasn't actually any wear on them. They, they were as new, but under the warranty program, they were having to be replaced. Um, so, so we did a cost benefit analysis, exactly how you just mentioned, Ron, you know, the cost of actually shutting the machine down and, and stopping it for the warranty maintenance to be performed. It, it, it just was not worth it because they had on top of the warranty, Believe it or not, all the parts that were replaced had to be paid for. They were they were external to the uh, the actual warranty maintenance being performed. So the parts still had to be paid, but the parts were not where the, the parts weren't hmm. showing any anywhere. Um, and then when the machine started up, um, it, it, it was taking around about four weeks to get back up to operational uh, performance prior to the shutdown for the warranty maintenance. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Sounds like the the Waddington effect, huh, Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> if you and what about <laughs> and what about what about the uh were the were, were the parts been been purchased from the supplier by any chance? Oh they were always they were all <laughs> OEM spares. And and I'm not saying that this did happen, but I they they were taking the parts away with them. They were putting the the exist the old parts that were being removed from the machine, <clears> you were putting <throat> them into the boxes and taking them away, and and I don't know, uh, there was just a little <clears> bit of something <throat> in my mind was telling me that these parts were coming back twelve months later, uh, to 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 be to be used again. I just there was no wear on them. We made we we measured them, we inspected them, and yet they'd been charged for parts that didn't need to be replaced, and then and then on the overhaul. That, like I said, the machine <clears throat> did not perform. It was taking approximately four weeks. So you've got so, the downtime. Yeah, you're, you're illustrating the same example that uh, that I came across, and it was a in a different kind of facility, but it was the same the same issue, right? It just yeah. wasn't <clears throat> more. It wasn't worth uh, you know worrying about. No. You know, no. so exactly. Now let, let's talk. Uh, you know, a little bit, and it's kind of hard to demonstrate this over the you know in this kind of format hmm. but uh, let's talk a little bit about the um uh you know th there's things that we've just been talking about uh, to consider so let's suppose you've got a, a machine that's a, a significant machine and over the past you know several a uh, couple of years you've had several breakdowns so as a part of your analysis you ought to look at the cost of those breakdowns both in terms of the out-of-pocket costs for the maintenance, plus the production, the value of the production losses, the gross profit that you otherwise could have generated as a result of that. So, and if if you believe that that will continue in the foreseeable future, if you just continue to do what you've always done, then that gives you a cash stream, right? And over whatever pick the number of years you're you're comfortable with and then compare that to if you buy new equipment where well, you've got an initial capital cost plus what do you believe you'll be able to improve in terms of improved production or lower maintenance costs 
And that's a prognostication. It may or may not be right. You have to use your best judgment. And so you do, you got two cash streams now and you calculate the net present value of that based on some discounted cash flow rate, let's say 10%. And what you may find, at least in one example I put in the paper, what you may find is that on face value, right, the uh, replacement is not the right thing to do <laughs> because you've just taken a linear cost out in time. And so you might conclude, well, I'm just going to live with what I got. On the other hand, if you look at net present value discounted that cash stream to present value what you might find is the opposite you really need to replace it so that's you know that's just uh, you know one example <clears throat> of things to consider when you're looking at you know consider all these things we've just been talking about but you know you're going to have to prognosticate you know predict the future which is really hard because we never get it right <clears throat> but it's better than just randomly you know de deciding that you can or can or will or won't at <clears> least <throat> you've got some basis for understanding the implications of your decision if you do or do not do what you uh have, have analyzed so mm -hmm. uh, any comments on that guys just to reinforce my previous point ron about being realistic based on uh, client's previous experience of what the performance of the new equipment is likely to be in its first couple of years of operation. Yeah. <clears throat> well, if you some, don't change build, your build, practices. Build, 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 a, build in some realism uh, to that. Yeah, because yeah, we're talking here about changing design practices, uh, purchasing practices up front, installation practices of the new, the new asset. Um, so if they're not ramping up, um, then you're likely to get have a, a dip before you even get back to the same performance levels you are up with the existing asset. So, anyways, th those are just some uh, initial thoughts for <clears> folks. <throat> uh, you know, if if they have questions, we'd be happy to you know try to comment <clears throat> on on any questions or comments they might have. And let's see, there's been nothing in the chat room, but if uh, you know folks go away and. Hmm. come up with something then that, that'd be fine with us so uh kim are you still hanging about out there unless you guys have any final comments maybe ron just just one thing you touched on there which resonated with me around pre predicting the future um and and actually modeling i keep i've mentioned it a few times modeling the 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 asset reliability um and, and basing it on your current practices to begin with um, and, and using like a Monte Carlo simulator over, mm -hmm. over a period of time to determine what the future will look like if you continue with your current practice and then identify within that, within that model where are the opportunities to optimise the programme, your maintenance programme, and that might mean comparing repair versus replace uh, it might mean comparing condition based versus fixed time or or even some components we might decide to run to failure because that is more effective than the other strategies so i, I think there is a, there is a, a case where I, I don't like to say that i'm a fortune teller but you know we there are there are tools available <clears throat> to us as reliability engineers that can help us you know plot the future based on past experiences and then help us identify ways of optimizing that. Yeah. I, I, I suspect though that most people out there aren't sophisticated enough to perform a, a, a Weibull or a Monte Carlo or some of those analyses. Yeah. But if, if you have access to that, then certainly I would encourage folks to, to do that. It'll give you some confidence limits around your decision-making process. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Andrew, anything else? No, I'm good. All right. Uh, Kim, are you out there? Sure am. <laughs> okay. Well, What's okay. our next one on, by the way? Yeah, the next one we're doing expectations, execution, and engagement essentials. Okay. 
All right, so we're going to be talking about the the soft stuff in the reliability OPEX program. You know, so the soft stuff, which is the hard stuff. You know, setting the yeah. right expectations, <clears throat> engaging the workforce, and and all that sort of thing. So, all right, guys, mm-hmm. I reckon we're uh, complete for the day. A little early again, I guess. Just we a just a few uh, minutes early. Yes. Yeah. So, well, thank you guys all so much. And thank you to our amazing audience for joining us today, too. Just a quick reminder, as Ron already said, you can see the next episode of Connect Conversations in two weeks. It'll be up. We have February 20th, same time, the two to three. I'm getting a few comments saying thank you guys very much. Thank you. And you can see any past episodes of Connect Conversations on YouTube over Mobius Connect or on Reliability at reliabilityconnect.com. Again, thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Stay safe. And we will see you all next time. Bye. Mm